much. Good evening. Um, we're so glad you all joined us for the film and panel discussion, Wildlife Crossings, Exploring Solutions to Prevent Wildlife Vehicle Collisions with Rob Amond and Liz Fairbank tonight. This is the fourth of a series of talks that Gallatin Valley Earth Day is holding um, from January through April, culminating in our annual Earth Day Festival, which will be April 22nd at the Emerson Center for the Arts and Culture. That same day, we'll also be holding our annual Earth Day Fun Run, and this year it will be benefiting the Indraland. Audubon Wetland Preserve, and that's also on April 22nd at the Gallatin County Regional Park. So I'm thr so thrilled to see all of you here tonight. And I also wanted to send out a big welcome to the tons of people that are joining us online tonight. My name is Ann Reddy, and I'm the chair of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day Committee. Uh, tonight's event has special meaning to me. Um, a few months ago, a traumatizing event happened to me um, that drove me, uh, drove home to me very clearly the importance of wildlife crossings. I was driving home a little after dusk, not far from here, uh, when suddenly a deer briefly appeared in my headlights before stepping right in front of my car while I was going like 45, 50 miles an hour down the highway here. Uh, in a flash, I saw the car hit the deer, it bounced forward, then my car hit it again. And at that point, unfortunately, the deer's body just imploded or exploded all over my car. And it really was horrible, right in front of my face on the windshield, all I could see was red as the blood just streamed across the windshield. And uh, when I was able to get off the road and stop, I saw that a good portion of, portion of my car was actually covered in shredded deer parts. It was really horrible, and the front of my car was damaged. Um, as I said before, it was really traumatizing for me, and I think it took me months to really truly get over it. And I left it to my dear husband to take my car to the car wash and open the hood and use the pressure sprayer to try and clear out all the shredded um, deer parts in my engine compartment. And uh, in addition, the memory of that event would come back to me every time I stepped into my garage because for months, my car emitted this very strange smell. And what's more, this was actually the second deer hit for our family. My husband had actually hit a deer a few, a number of months before. And so the total repair bill for our two cars was over $13,000. So, um, and I'm sure I am not unique in, in this experience. And I was just curious with a show of hands, how many people here in our audience here in the fireside room have had the unfortunate experience of hitting wildlife and I see quite a number of hands actually, oh my gosh, like half the audience. <laughs> so um, yeah, so unfortunately it's not a good situation. Um, I, well, I wanted to ask you one more question, a show of hands. I was just curious how many of you were able to either um, watch the recording or watch um, the event that we had last week called the importance of private lands for wildlife, the role of land trusts. Did any of you guys get to see it? Oh, I see a couple hands, great. Well, don't worry if you're interested in seeing it, the recording is up on our website, day.org, on our YouTube channel. And I really encourage you to watch it. Um, you won't be disappointed. Um, I've had a number of people saying, telling me it was actually one of the best wildlife talks they've seen. And um, I also learned from Chet Work who gave that talk, that protecting private lands um, using the tool of land trusts goes hand in hand with wildlife crossings that we'll be talking about tonight. And that is because um, he showed very vividly to me on the map, um, if um, the corridors that the animals use or migration corridors that they use to get to the wildlife crossings are developed, um, then there's no way actually they can get to the wildlife crossings to use them. So therefore it is really important for those to work hand in hand. Um, to bring home how important wildlife crossings can be for wildlife tonight, we are really excited to show a short 12 minute film called Reconnecting Wild. Um, but before I do that, I really wanted to thank the partners um, 
uh, that we um, partnered with for tonight's event, and that is the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University, the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, Gallatin Wildlife Association, and ARC Solutions. Now, the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State, it's the largest university-based research center focused on rural transportation issues in the country. And the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, it's a Bozeman-based nonprofit that works both locally but also globally, and it promotes ecological co connectivity, supports healthy wildlife habitat, and it also safeguards um, nature's resilience to climate change. So I encourage you to please check out their websites. If you by chance um, did register for this event tonight, then we will automatically after the event be sending you an email with um, a number of resources, including links to their websites. And lastly, tonight's free program is only possible because of the really generous support from a large number of nonprofits and um, businesses and government agencies in our community. And so I'd like to thank our fiscal sponsor, Greater Gallatin United Way, our premier sponsors, the city of Bozeman, the um, Audi Bozeman and Gallatin Subaru, our benefactor, benefactor sponsor, um, which is the Sacagawea Audubon Society, and then our stewards, which include Happy Trash Can, Bridger Bowl Ski Area, um, Bozeman Green Build, Valley of the Flowers Landscaping, and last but not least, Gallatin Wildlife Association. And then a big thanks to the scores of community volunteers who help make this, these events happen. Without their generous support, of course, we would not be able to bring you tonight's program. And also a big thanks to Hope Lutheran Church and our tech team, uh, Lorraine Reed, who is helping us remotely tonight, Emma Narotsky from Sacagawea Audubon and Taylor Burlage. And my very last thank you, I'd just like to give a big thanks to Renee Callahan from ARC Solutions. She provided us with the file for our short film tonight. Um, if you're not aware of them, ARC Solutions is their primary goal is to ensure safe passage for both humans and wildlife on and across our roads. And they do this by supporting the study, the design, and the construction of wildlife crossings um, across, actually all across North America. So I encourage you to check out their website also. So now let's get on with the program. Um, uh, let's watch the film Reconnecting Wild. Um, this film tells the remarkable story of the Nevada Department of Transportation and their um, partners who worked for more than a decade um, to improve human safety by reconnecting an historic mule deer crossing that crossed over Highway US 93 and Interstate 80 in rural Elko County, Nevada. So um, I'll go ahead and start the, um, the film. We spend eight billion dollars a year running over wildlife. When did this become okay? If you took a fraction of that eight billion dollars, you take a quarter of it and you invest it in crossing structures, this problem would be solved in a generation. The number one issue facing wildlife today is loss of habitat and habitat fragmentation. One of the reasons that animals move is because they're not able to get exactly what they need where they are. And so when you have these migrations that have survived over millennia, it's because the animals are following that fresh green grass as it's greening up. This pattern of movement is actually what enables them to survive in what are otherwise these incredibly harsh conditions. 
the importance of intact habitat for wildlife populations can't be overstated. When we're talking about intact habitat, we're talking about habitats that haven't been unnaturally disturbed uh, due to invasive species, invasive vegetation, impacts from structures that people place on them, housing developments, roads, anything that makes noise and, and, and really disturbs the habitat is gonna have a negative impact on wildlife populations. So the more open space, the more open intact habitat we can have, the better off our wildlife populations, the healthier their populations are gonna be in the, in the long run. An estimated one to two million large animals are hit every year by motorists on our highway. They result in about 200 human deaths and close to 30,000 injuries. And this is at an annual cost to Americans of over $8 billion. The safety aspect is huge because uh, I wouldn't want any of my family or friends or anybody else to, you know, have to be put in a situation where, you know, these, these animals are trying to cross and you end up hitting them. And it's just, uh, we need to do better. What does it look like to fix this problem? What does it look like to build a bridge for animals with the goal that ultimately animals will have essentially their own pathways, their own highway, if you will, for them to get from point A to B where they need to go. In our eyes, Nevada has absolutely been a leader in this area. They have put in crossings for mule deer over US 93. Those crossings have been in for a while now. I know that they've had something like 37,000 successful uses of these crossings, and that basically means that there are 37,000 times that there wasn't a potential to have a driver possibly hitting an animal on that roadway. We built a very first overpass in Nevada back in 2010 and we were one of the first in North America. Since then, we've added additional five for a total of six across the state, five of which address the mule deer herd that pass through the Pequot Summit Mountain Range. This particular deer herd, known as the Area 7 mule deer herd in northeast Nevada, makes a migration from the Jarbage Mountains down into the Pequot Mountains during this migration. And the reason why mule deer need to do this is the snow loads that happen in the Jarbage Mountains would be too severe and intense for the deer to be able to find forage and make it through the winter. So they are forced to, to make these long treks down to an area that doesn't receive as much snow so that they can make it through the winter and uh, rear their fawns and have them survive so that they can continue on. There's about 60% of this herd that makes this migration, and we believe that it could be as many as 5,500 deer or so crossing on Highway 93, and then of those, maybe about 4,500 or so that are crossing um, across the Pequots into the southern part of the Pequots to spend the rest of their winter. Nevada Department of Wildlife has been monitoring deer in northeastern Nevada for many years and when we came to the table trying to figure out where these crossings should be, we came with a lot of data about um, the migration um, and historical movements of these mule deer and where the best place would be for these uh, crossings to be most successful. We actually looked at a variety of data, including movement data that was provided by the Department of Wildlife, as well as our crash records and our carcass records. And we see where all that data overlaps to see where we're having the highest impact for potential mitigation. Well, I think as we were inadvertently one of the front runners uh, diving into the construction of overcrossings, there was a lot of research available when we first started and uh, we were really reaching out to anyone we could just to uh, help us develop, uh, you know, guidance on that. And, you know, how big were these supposed to be? You know, how long? What works? We uh, ended up seeing what the Canadians did up in Banff uh, with their crossing. I contacted them. They were good enough to send us some basic plans and actually talk about it a little bit. And even at that time, it was new for the Canadians and that they were getting positive feedback and data. 
The largest overpass is 200 feet long along the roadway and approximately 600 feet long traversing across the highway. Consistent uh, with the other two crossings on I-80 that are all 200 feet long, the three structures are some of the largest in the United States. The wildlife crossings are fairly simple structures. There's not a lot of complicated elements. We start with the main foundations that will support the entire structure. We follow that with precast arch elements um, or steel structural elements. Uh, then next we construct the mechanically stabilized earth walls that will support the fill, uh, backfill or soil that then goes over the structure. And generally there's the final finishing touches we put on the fencing and any vegetation that's required. By using precast elements, we can really minimize the impacts to traffic, as opposed to our typical cast-in-place construction that can take months. Um, with the use of precast elements, we can limit that time frame down to just several days, and so it makes a tremendous impact on our schedules, um, thereby minimizing the impacts to traffic, but also getting these structures constructed in a timely fashion just so they can be beneficial for the migrations and, and uh, uh, you know, again, any impacts we can make to minimize those vehicular you know, animal collisions is important and the faster we can get these built the better. The East Pequop uh, is probably one of my favorite overpasses that we've constructed just because of the topography and the way we were able to make it blend in. We did have some additional unique features to this one we haven't incorporated in the past including berms on the structure just to help reduce some of the sound impacts from traffic and um, reduce some of the visual impacts for the wildlife as they cross. Some of the innovative things that we were able to accomplish on this project is dealing with some of the fence issues and funneling the animals to the structures. We try to use a 45 degree angle to allow as much of an openness ratio um, at the entrance of those structures and really funnel those animals to the most uh, successful crossing points. Um, we also utilized uh, fencing at the end of our fencing project where we would pinch the fencing into the roadway um, and we think that's really helped in reducing the number of collisions within the project limits. We are still monitoring deer. Uh, we have put uh, GPS tracking devices on over 150 deer since 2008. And so we were able to watch what the deer were doing before the crossings went in and then how they've been using um, the area since. And it has been a huge success. When the crossings first go in, the deer can get a little bit confused and a little unsure about the fencing. But once they've figured it out, uh, we can watch where where deer are almost on a string, they just go right to where the crossing is and use it without any trouble at all. I do think these structures should be part of an infrastructure growth plan in the future. And we as a department have already, I think, headed that direction. The initial crossings uh, were obviously constructed out on existing roadways, but uh, since that time that we started constructing some of these over 10 years ago, we have included them in roadway expansion projects, and it has become uh, you know, more of a component to our larger construction jobs to consider this up front, you know, part of these wildlife and vehicular interactions and how do we address that, and um, I think it has become more important to the department. When you put these in the right places, you are saving people's lives, you're saving wildlife lives, you're reconnecting these places that we call home that have been severed by roads, and again, properly placed at your highest priority areas, you're saving taxpayer money. Because if you have a stretch that has about five or more deer vehicle collisions per mile per year, it actually costs society more to do nothing just to let those animals die and let those people get injured than it costs to put in a structure that's gonna last 75 years and poof, you've solved the problem overnight. You're saving people's lives, you're saving wildlife lives, you're reconnecting habitats, you're saving taxpayer money. Done, solved.
two announcements. I know that people in the audience here didn't get to see the whole film, but no worries because um, you can go to our website on Friday and watch the recording of the whole event, which will include the whole film. <laughs> and uh, also, if you did register for the event, we'll be sending that to you automatically on Friday so that you can um, watch it all and see the whole film. So, because it really is very good. So, um, okay, well, uh, one more announcement. Um, I just want to let you people know who are joining us online that unfortunately you don't get to see our beautiful faces here tonight because of a technical difficulty, but you can hear our voices. So don't worry, um, you'll see the screens, but you won't be able to see uh, our speakers' faces tonight. But um, no worries, you can hear us, so. Um, well, now I'd like to proceed and further explore the, um, whoops, I see that I need to progress these screens. Liz, I need your help again. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not familiar with your computer. So I just need to move those screens forward. And one more, and one more. Oh. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, great. Okay, now I would love to introduce our first speaker for tonight, which is Rob Ammon. Um, and I, but before I do that, I just wanted to let you know that we, after Rob and Liz get done speaking, um, we will have a question and answer period. So if you're joining us online, I just wanted to alert you that on your screen, there is a column on the right side of your screen. If you go part way down that column, you'll see a questions box type in your questions there, and Emma here will read those questions to Rob and Liz. And then if you're in the audience, I will be going around with this microphone and you just have to raise your hand and I'll be happy to bring the microphone over to you so you can um, ask your question directly to our um, panelists. Okay, so now I'd love to introduce Rob Amant. Um, he is the Road Ecology Program Manager for the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University. And he manages projects throughout North America that reduce wildlife vehicle collision and reconnect habitat. And he's also serves as the senior conservationist at the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, where he leads science and policy efforts to advance wildlife corridors and ecological co connectivity internationally. And in fact, he just, he told me recently that he is heading off to India pretty soon um, to do some work there on that. So, um, okay, well, if you can join me in a round of applause, I would like to bring Rob up to the podium here. Thanks, Rob. Thank you all. Can everyone hear, can, uh, can you hear me enough? Or? Yes, we will. Okay, I'll set this down. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to uh, talk about wildlife crossings, road ecology, and some of the different facets. Uh, and um, we were excited at WTI to uh, be able to pull some new data. So I'll be talking about some information that has, no one's seen before. So, uh, and then um, I also work at uh, the center uh, and I tell people I get to do science in the morning and policy in the afternoon. So I really have a nice mix of, uh, of jobs uh, between the two organizations. And uh, uh, much of what I'll be presenting tonight uh, is by a team of road ecologists at WTI. Uh, we have two wildlife ecologists, uh, Dr. Marcel Hauser, who's based out of Missoula, and Dr. Tony Clevenger, who's based out of Banff. So a lot of the research that has come from those uh, uh, for over 40 crossings uh, have been the result of 20 years of Tony's career. So, uh, and then uh, Matt Bell, who has been, uh, did a bunch of the data analysis and preparation for tonight. 
So without, I'll try to move through these uh, fairly rapidly. Um, it's not forwarding. Mm. Do I have to move the arrow now? This one work? There we go. So these are the most often used statistics uh, for the national perspective. And uh, that, this was a WTI study we did way back in 07. And uh, with the recent passage of the Inf Infrastructure Act, uh, it's being uh, updated, but uh, we don't get a shot at doing it again. Uh, it's being done by federal highways internally. But here in Montana, this is uh, uh, some of the data uh, from the MDT. And so there's basically two data sets. The top one, the, the dashed line, is carcass data. That's picked up by the maintenance crews when uh, usually large-bodied animals are either on the road or next to the road. And they pick them up and they record them uh, and, take, uh, and bring the information back in and then compost the animal. But unfortunately, it looks like they're not doing as much recording as they used to. Uh, so um, again, we just worked this up, so we have to have a discussion why there's been such a drastic drop in, in carcass reporting. Because the traditional way of most analyses is using the crash data, the bottom line. Those are collisions uh, that are recorded by law enforcement. So they have been for decades consistently uh, when a, a law enforcement sheriff or highway patrol uh, ha attends a, an accident, they put wild animal. That's the only category. So all you get is wild animal from the crash data, but from the carcass data, they record it, whether it's an elk, a moose, a bighorn sheep, whether it's a female or a male, whether it's an adult or say a calf or a young. So there's the two data sets are a mix of information that uh, I, I'll, we've used to report out to you uh, the picture here in Montana. And so uh, this is the composition of that of the roadkill here in Montana. The top one, uh, I'm sorry, so the composition by species is based again on the carcass data, uh, not the crash data. And it shows that uh, almost two thirds are uh, white-tailed deer and about 25%, a little over, is mule deer. So that's over 90% of all uh, collisions are with deer here, here in the state. This is 10, 10 years of data that we uh, are, are in this analysis. And then of course, elk and moose, uh, wolf and grizzly bear. And of course, we also know there's bighorn sheep and, and bison and, and many other species that's in the, the 5%. But this is the first time I've ever seen that we really ever worked this up and tried to get a good idea of what, what and how, uh, what's the composition of, of the roadkill. And then we also looked at the fatalities. Again, this comes from the crash data, not the carcass data. Uh, and uh, so just so folks know, at least over the 10 year period, it's a, a little over four fatalities uh, across the state each year. Uh, and then we are working on a current report. And so this hasn't been published yet, but you get to look at some early results. And we took again, 10 years of the crash data and we partitioned uh, the highway system up to roughly quarter mile segments. And then we looked at where the highest rates of crashes were for each of those segments. The red segments are the top 10 percentile. And so you can see in our neck of the woods, both 191, I-90, and 89 up Paradise Valley have quite a few in the top 10 percentile. And the big north-south US 93 on the west side of the state also has an unusually high amount. And you can see out in the plains, uh, the crash rates aren't quite as, as high as uh, the mountainous part of, of, of the state of Montana. And I wanna give one uh, a precautionary tale about this data and that it's underreported. And so this is just three examples of where people tried to sample what the, the departments of transportation were using for their databases and in British Columbia, when they compared four different databases, they realized that the Ministry of Transportation, the MOT, was, uh, it's actually, there were three times more crashes than, the, that they, than what the 
MOT was using. Uh, a Virginia Department of Transportation researcher looked at their data set, then went out and systematically collected data and found it was over eight times higher than what the state was using to identify their hotspots or areas of concern. So, and then for small animals too, this was another experiment. Small carcasses tend to get um, eaten by other animals, scavenged. So uh, again, if you don't get out there and systematically collect the data, you're really, your data sets are under reporting. So again, when I, I talk later about the costs of all these collisions here in Montana, you'll just keep in mind that these are all very conservative numbers because uh, we haven't tested it here in our state, but it's assumed that there's a bit of underreporting than what really is happening out uh, on the ground. So uh, using this data, we want to look at, you know, where the hotspots are for collisions with the large mammals. We may want to look at where uh, roads are barriers and, and species aren't getting across the road. We also want to look at con conservation. And all the species listed here, salamanders in um, Waterton National Park, flying squirrels in North Carolina, uh, lynx in Colorado, crossings are be being built just for conservation purposes. We don't always have to use those hot spots for safety rationales uh, to build crossings, and they can be quite small for salamanders, so it's not very expensive either. And then uh, lastly, if we do invest in these uh, crossing structures, we want to make sure it's uh, cost effective. So I'll talk a little bit about what the different costs of the mitigation measures are. And so we have a toolbox. There's over 24 mitigation measures to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions. And we just did a study, uh, completed a, a review of those 24 measures. And they're categorized by three strategies. Influence driver behavior, make people slow down, be more alert. Uh, influence animal behavior, make them not want to go onto the road or near the road. Uh, or reduce their population size, so that'll ultimately reduce collisions with them, uh, or separate the animals from the, the road and its traffic. So of those 24 measures, here's just a, a short list of ineffective measures, ones that don't even achieve a 50% 50, 50 reduction in wildlife vehicle collisions. Uh, most of them don't uh, improve ha of the connectivity across the road either. And so the traditional uh, sign on the on, like on the bottom left, that photo, reducing posted speed limits, people drive the design of the road. It's well studied. Uh, so just posting signs doesn't really help. Even with law enforcement, there have been some studies to show uh, it hasn't been very effective either for reducing wildlife vehicle collisions and reducing nighttime speed at night. You know, if you just drive a little bit slower, uh, again, that hasn't uh, shown even a 50% reductions. It'll have some reduction, but not 50%. Then again, at modifying animal behavior, deer whistles, those red reflectors that catch the headlight and are supposed to freeze the deer in the right of way. And when the car passes, the light goes out of the reflector uh, and um, or to reduce roadside vegetation and it's nutritional, the attractiveness of vegetation along the road. So none of these uh, work at, at least they're not effective up to 50%. So here's what is effective. Um, and mitigation measures that influence driver behavior, you can see uh, all of these at least achieved a 50%, but uh, really none of them help for connecting habitats and, and movement across the road except when you close the road seasonally. And this is just a, a, what's used in protected areas, maybe a wildlife management area, a national park, uh, but not really on our US highways or interstate highways. Um, and then uh, when you try to influence animal behavior, it's even a smaller category, only two that uh, achieve at least a 50%. And both of these aren't changing their behavior. It's actually reducing the size of the animals, either by moving them or uh, reducing the herd size. And this is really in suburban areas where it's mostly done, where there's a lot of white-tailed deer. And there's no improvement in connectivity. And then the last category, this is where you separate animals from drivers, from the traffic. 
and it's quite effective. These are highly effective, 80% or greater. They're all proven. The top one, uh, wildlife barrier is just fencing alone. Of course, it's gonna stop the collisions, but it reduces uh, connectivity. So this is why we use wildlife crossings because they're proven, they're highly effective and they improve connectivity. So that's why uh, all across the world, basically this is primarily the method. You can use the other methods of the, and measures I talked about and they can be effective at reducing collisions or collisions until you can build a structure sometimes. So uh, it's not that, like don't use them, it's just uh, use them sparingly. But if you really want habitat connectivity, you have to use the structures. And there's quite a variety of, of different types. Uh, you saw the ones that they designed in Nevada and sometimes they use the concrete box culverts or, or other types of structures or make bridges longer. There's some really inexpensive ways to still use structures. So uh, these are just uh, uh, different types. All of these are in the BAMP, out of the BAMP crossing system. And then uh, I wanted to talk about the cost real briefly. Um, and so this is the old study. We published it in 09 uh, out of that 2007 national report based on that. And you'll see it was about 6,600 for uh, the average deer collision. Um, and we only used the hunting value of the animals. So it was just in-state and out-of-state hunting licenses. That's the only value we gave to wildlife, not like for photography or uh, for their existence, et cetera, for their conservation value. Uh, and so it went six, 17,000, 30,000 for, for moose. And we, uh, it was just updated. So that's what I wanted to show you, the new numbers um, uh, out of a report that uh, Marcel Hauser led and two economists from uh, the University of Montana were also on the team. And uh, I just wanna talk about two lines, the subtotal line. Uh, so we're not gonna talk about the value of the wildlife, but just what it costs when to, to, for humans, right? The human costs is what we call them. And the subtotal is 14,000 for deer. So it's more than doubled uh, since the last assessment or evaluation. The 17,000 for elk is now 45,000 and the 30 some thousand for a, a moose is now 82,000. And then the economists did a thing called passive use value. And that's the value of the animal's existence and knowing that it will uh, exist into the future for future generations. And um, so we, uh, this is a new piece that hadn't been done before either. Uh, and it was done for deer, elk, moose. They're also in, our, in the report, there's wolves and grizzly bears. Uh, they did a few carnivores where there was existing data and, and turtles uh, actually, and desert tortoises. So um, they have looked at the different values, but the three that we're comparing between the two studies, you'll see now, if you add those in the total value, uh, instead of using hunting licenses, but using passive use value, has now you know, tripled and almost four times as high as previously. So the cost of collisions have gone up significantly. And so that justifies building crossing structures, investing in crossings, because the return's better if, uh, if you don't do anything. Uh, all those collisions start accruing. So um, we first, I wanted to talk about, we ran those numbers again with the carcass data for the 10 years here in Montana. And we did it both ways without the passive use, which some people say we don't believe in that use of those numbers and just to the human values. And you can see it's 87 million a year. And we, we, we use carcass because it had deer elk moose and we had values for deer elk moose. Uh, and then we also looked at passive use, uh, adding that value on. And so that's the difference, 87 million a year versus 120 million a year here in Montana. So one, uh, my, I also wanna remind you, again, if, you, if it was Virginia, we would multiply this by eight times. So uh, Virginia had a half a billion a year. Uh, you could see if we put multiples on this, it would be significantly higher as well. 
but anyhow, just very conservatively, but these are the numbers on average each year here in Montana. Uh, and so what does it cost to reverse that? Uh, we also, this report updated the, the cost of the mitigation measures. And so these are sort of the average costs from, uh, for the different types of, of uh, items you use for crossing structures and the fence that uh, you direct the animals and to the crossing structures and keep them off the road. So um, you can see that uh, those concrete box culverts, for example, can vary depending on their size from 100,000 each to over a million. So uh, most of these costs have very, you know, lows and highs depending on how many, how many meters wide, how many meters high, or how many meters long. But roughly uh, all of these um, have gone up, but not as rapidly as the costs of the collisions have gone up. So what it's basically doing, and I didn't have time tonight to talk much longer, so, um, but you can look at what it's costing not to do anything, as Renee said in the film, uh, but um, also if you do the investment, you invest once, put in the infrastructure, it lasts for 75 years, and if you're reducing those collisions each year, it pays. So public investment in the infrastructure ultimately pays back uh, over time uh, for the lifetime of the infrastructure that's bought once at the very beginning, but accrues for the 75 years during the life of the infrastructure. And fences, we, you even build into the model, every 25 years you have to replace your fence. And we also built in the costs of maintaining the, the structures and the fencing. And I, I, that's a whole nother piece that's in the report. All of these reports are, um, I have on the web, I, ha I think it's the next slide, sorry. This is my summary. And then I'll get to the website where you can get all this information and the explanations in more detail. But uh, WVDs, although they're underreported, uh, many segments can make the economic cost. It may not be the primary driver, but at least for some people, it's important to know you're using the public dollars wisely, especially the agencies. Uh, it's just one economic, the economic lens is just, you know, one value you would want in the decision-making process. Uh, and last of all, remember, it is the agency's budgets that pay for the mitigation measures but all the benefits accrue to the public. However, they are public dollars. So that's one way to um, think about why sometimes there's reticence to build these expensive structures, even though they're gonna return uh, uh, and benefit uh, the public economically. So with that, I will show you the website for those online. I have a, a, a sheet outside for after the meeting for people in the room. Uh, to get all these different reports on the cost benefits and some of these new studies. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. That was really interesting. Um, our next speaker is Liz, um, Liz, and she's a road ecologist at the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. Um, and she focuses on improving habitat connectivity and reducing the negative impacts of roads on wildlife and ecosystems. Uh, Liz has contributed to numerous road ecology research projects in the Western United States, including an animal vehicle collisions on the Blackfeet Reservation, ungulate migration routes in Wyoming, and effects of roads on desert tortoises in the Southwest. So please join me in welcoming Liz to the stage here. And thank you for that introduction and Rob for the crash course in, in road ecology. Um, let me just so, um, as Anne mentioned, uh, my name is Liz Fairbank. I work for the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, where our mission is to protect life on Earth by promoting ecological connectivity to support healthy wildlife habitats and safeguard nature's resilience to climate change. 
So first you might ask, what is ecological connectivity? This is really just the degree to which landscapes allow species movement and natural ecological processes, basically allowing species to make regular movements to find food, mates, and respond to climate change, as well as allowing ecological processes um, like pollination and stream flows to occur. So as you can imagine, roads have big impacts on connectivity, basically fragmenting habitat up into um, smaller and smaller patches that are less resilient to all kinds of stressors um, like drought and disease and ultimately species needing to shift their ranges in response to a changing climate. So um, this graph on the right here is just a very simplified um, kind of representation of how roads and traffic uh, impact wildlife movement and also wildlife vehicle collisions. So basically, if you have roads with low traffic volumes, you're going to have wildlife able to cross pretty successfully, not a lot of wildlife vehicle collisions. Uh, when you get up into this mid-range of um, higher traffic, around 6,000 vehicles per day, um, you have a lot more conflict between wildlife and traffic, where it's harder for them to cross the highway and they're also getting hit a lot more frequently. And then when you get up to really high traffic volumes, around 15,000 vehicles per day, animals will either stop trying to cross the highway or the ones that do try will get hit really frequently. So um, traffic volumes have a big impact as well as other linear features like fences or the number of lanes of traffic, things like that. So um, we all live in this amazing place here in the greater Yellowstone. Um, I think a lot of us understand that protected areas alone really aren't enough. Um, a lot of the species here need to move long distances either seasonally or throughout their lifetimes to um, basically get to the food, water, shelter, et cetera, that they need. Um, and what we've learned from studying all these charismatic species, you know, elk, moose, grizzly bear, pronghorn, bighorn sheep, is that um, they, they make these big movements and they rely not just on public lands, but private lands and often have to cross dozens of highways to, to make these seasonal movements every year. So, um, let's see. I'm gonna just talk a little bit more specifically about some work that we have going on on Highway 191. Um, like Rob mentioned, there's basically these two different types of wildlife vehicle collision data, crash data reported by law enforcement and carcass data that's picked up by maintenance personnel. Overall, Montana ranks second in the nation for wildlife vehicle collisions based on State Farm Insurance data, um, with maintenance crews picking up about 6,000 carcasses every year uh, and about 10% of all crashes in Montana occurring with wildlife. Um, and unlike the 10% statewide, there's lots of areas locally and regional that have much higher rates. So on Highway 191, about a quarter of all crashes are actually with wildlife, 24%. Um, and this is also a really important area for wildlife movement in and out of the park, um, across national forest land, and also across a whole matrix of, of private land, uh, roads, fences, et cetera. So in order to begin assessing wildlife vehicle conflict on Highway 191, um, as well as Montana 64, the road that goes up to Big Sky, uh, CLLC and WTI partnered to develop a formal wildlife and transportation assessment. So really the, the goal of this assessment is to combine public agency data, citizen science, uh, local and expert knowledge, as well as engineering concepts um, to come up with some potential solutions to reduce conflicts with wildlife and make sure that uh, this landscape uh, maintains its permeability. So although we knew that there was lots of different data available publicly, uh, like Rob mentioned, we know that that's an undercount um, of what's actually happening on the ground. Also, these traditional data sets typically don't include smaller species, and um, they, they also don't include information about where animals are trying to cross roads and where they're successfully crossing now, but might be impacted by increasing traffic volume down the road. So we basically um, decided to initiate a citizen science data collection effort using a smartphone app. Um, this was originally developed by the Western Transportation Institute, National Park Service, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to collect data on federal public lands. But we've partnered with those agencies now in order to be able to use this tool um, for citizen science and other types of data collection. 
So at the same time as we initiated the citizen science project, we began researching and compiling other types of data that we could use to inform this um, analysis on Highway 191. So this really includes wildlife vehicle collision data. Um, that's, you know, again, collected by the agencies crash data, carcass data. Uh, we also got um, grizzly bear mortality from the interagency grizzly bear study team, as well as some carcass data that was collected by the park service for the section of highway that runs through Yellowstone National Park. Um, in addition, we um, were able to access a bunch of different wildlife observation and movement data. So this can be GPS collar data, aerial surveys that Fish, Wildlife and Parks conducts, and then a lot of different observation data from uh, the Forest Service and National Park Service, as well as, again, the, the data collected by citizens. And then habitat connectivity and suitability data. A lot of this is modeling um, and applies to a variety of different species. Some of them are species specific models. Some of them are species agnostic is the name for it, but basically they represent the whole suite of species on the landscape instead of just um, GPS collar data that we only have for a few species like elk and grizzly bear. So those are really important in representing kind of the broader habitat needs um, across the landscape, not just for the specific kind of more charismatic species that we had better data for. And we did not do this alone. So um, throughout this process, we consulted with our technical advisory committee. And this is really an interdisciplinary team, interagency team that we um, had advised us throughout this process. And so you can see the list of different agencies here, the Montana Department of Transportation, Federal Highway Administration, the US Forest Service, National Park Service, Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team, US Fish and Wildlife Service, Gallatin County, um, and then we had also a lot of data and support from Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. So overall, um, with the CLLC and WTI, uh, research team plus all these different agencies. We had a mix of biologists, ecologists, engineers, um, land planners coming together to figure out, okay, what different data sets do we have? How can we analyze this in the best way? They also came out, um, spent two days with us in the field, going to different sites that we identified through our spatial analysis um, and helping us to come up with recommendations on what we could do. So, this fall, we went out in the field. Um, we basically did ran the spatial analysis with all those different data sets. We identified 10 different stretches of highway that we needed to go and look at and see what was happening on the ground, what could be done. And in order to evaluate each site and basically prioritize them, we came up with this field evaluation matrix. Um, and this is something that's been used in, in other studies as well. Um, and we just adapted it really to work well for our process here. So uh, one through five were things that were scored based on our data analysis. Um, basically each of these different criteria got a score between one and five. Um, and again, these, these first five were basically filled out before we got out in the field, um, sometimes adjusted once we were out there, especially this land security piece. And this is really important. Basically, um, in order for a crossing to be built, there either needs to be public land on either side of the highway or private land that has some kind of durable conservation agreement, like a conservation easement on it. Um, like Rob mentioned, the lifespan of these projects is 75 years. And so um, obviously we don't wanna be spending millions of dollars building crossings in places where there might be a subdivision in 10 years. So the land security piece is really important and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so numbers six through nine here were evaluated in the field by the research team and the technical advisory committee. Um, and a lot of this is like the local conservation value. Again, the data sets that we have um, gave us a lot of information, but going out in the field with our local biologist from the Forest Service, from the DOT, um, and consulting with our Fish, Wildlife, and Parks biologist gave us a lot more fine scale information about the movements that they're seeing and the different conflicts that they're witnessing on the ground. Um, our engineering team talked through a bunch of different mitigation options, and this is really dependent, again, um, on things like topography, where there's existing structures, what could be done to retrofit those to better accommodate wildlife passage. 
Um, and then things like the barrier effect. So we, we looked at traffic volumes adjacent to each of these sites and talked through kind of what is the barrier effect? Is there fencing adjacent to the highway? Um, is there an access road? Are there a bunch of driveways? All of these different things that can make it harder for wildlife to cross a road. And then vulnerability. Um, this was also really important. We had the Gallatin County planners um, with us out in the field and talked through basically what areas, um, you know, are really likely to be developed in the future and what the, what the pressure is. So again, not wanting to build something that's going to last for 75 years if there's going to be a bunch of development around it and it's no longer going to be suitable habitat for wildlife. So um, this is really just the first time that you're going to be hearing about this. We're going to be uh, releasing the final report sometime this spring. Currently, we're going back and forth again with the technical advisory committee, having them review the document, the recommendations, and just make sure that we're really on the same page um, and we have a fully vetted document that we can really begin to act on when it's finished. So once we have that done, we'll be uh, basically trying to have events all over in Bozeman and Big Sky and West Yellowstone to get that information out to people um, and work with agencies, organizations, uh, local communities to determine, you know, which projects are going to move forward, what the course of action and next steps will be. Um, there's lots of things to consider, again, with the land conservation piece. Working with land trusts will be really important. Working with private landowners adjacent to the highway will be really important. Having community support and buy-in for any project um, is critically important for MDT to want to, you know, invest heavily in it. Um, and so, yes, just keep your, keep your ears open. There will be a lot of next steps and opportunities to engage down the road. So one other thing I just want to note is we're in a really exciting time in the world of wildlife crossings. The bipartisan infrastructure law that passed in 2021 actually has dedicated funding for wildlife crossings for the first time. Um, and so that's the Wildlife Crossing Pilot Program. It's $350 million in dedicated funding for over the course of five years just for wildlife crossings. And 60% of those funds will go to projects in rural areas. But Perhaps even more exciting um, is that there's expanded eligibility criteria for projects that reduce wildlife vehicle collisions and improve habitat connectivity in a bunch of the other multi-billion dollar federal programs. So um, federal lands access program is one that Highway 191 could be eligible for. There's many others. And this is really the first time that we've seen language around uh, wildlife vehicle collision reduction and especially improving habitat connectivity in these major federal infrastructure programs. So very exciting time. Um, and I think with that, I will just thank our funders here, uh, the Volgino Foundation, the Big Sky uh, Resort Tax, Yellowstone Club Community Foundation, and Moonlight Basin Community Foundation. Um, and I think we have time for questions. Okay, thanks so much, Rob and Liz. It was really interesting, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions in the audience, both here in person and online. Um, and as I said before, just if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. And we'll be switching back and forth between the in person audience, and um, Emma will be reading questions from the audience. And I see a hand up already here, so we'll start with this gentleman here. Uh, my name is uh, Steph Farron, a neighbor of Ken here. We live um, in Gateway up on Hawk Hill. So we're sort of off the highway a little bit by like a mile, but we're up on the hill. We probably have two to 300 resident elk in our neighborhood. So these elk have been there for about 13 years. So they've lost all their migratory instincts but they cross 191 all the time. There's always a corpse every morning somewhere in the ditch. So um, our neighbor is Rob Arnott, who's Ted Turner's wildlife manager. So we've had discussions around this. And there are, in Gateway particularly, there's two areas where the elk always cross. One is between Cottonwood and our road, which is Hawk Hill, and the other one's about two miles down from Little Bear, sort of toward the canyon. So they, it's those two areas every day. And the elk have learned to wait at five o'clock, they sit, 
had all the traffic coming at Big Sky. When there's a gap, they go one by one and they block traffic. So because they're not migratory and they're resident, but the problem is still inherent, <laughs> what can we do to try to leverage those arches or something in that area? Because I've been to Banff and Jasper and I've seen those and I've talked to um, some people that worked in the national park and they, I said, why, don't, why is it always on top of the road, not underneath? And they said, well, some species don't like to go underneath because they think there's predators waiting on the other side, which makes sense to me. Um, but, you know, elk are unique because they have a lead female in the most herds. So once they learn where to cross, they just follow her all the time. So what could we do to get the conversation started about the elk problem? The, the deer problem exists, I get it. But damaging and, and a car L collision is never ends up good for anyone right? it's expensive and the car is totaled you know um who do we talk to how do we get that conversation going within gateway because that's the problem area really um sort of between gateway and the mouth of the canyon because there's so many elk there and they live there all year long so any recommendations would be appreciated Um, yeah, thanks for that. So uh, I wasn't presenting results here tonight because our report is in final, um, but I think I can at least safely let you know that our, our number one priority area identified is from Gateway to Spanish Peaks, um, Spanish Creek, excuse me. So we've been having a bunch of conversations with the different agencies about what our recommendations are there. It's really difficult, especially in Gateway because of all of the different small parcels. So you mentioned the Turner Ranch. There's one area where um, their property is on both sides of the highway, really close to the mouth of the canyon. Um, and so that's awesome because they have a conservation easement on that. Um, but a lot of the area further north is really highly fragmented, really small parcels, lots of different landowners that need to be working together. Um, so one of the things that really needs to happen, especially in the, you know, the two locations that you're talking about, is land conservation. Basically, for a wildlife crossing structure to be built, um, there needs to be some participation um, from, from the landowners adjacent to the highway to say, okay, we're willing to um, you know, put some kind of conservation agreement on our property. And so some of the next steps um, will definitely be reaching out, seeing if there is a willingness to do that, seeing if there is community support, um, you know, building coalitions of people, working with land trusts to say, okay, what can we do, what's possible? And where because if we can get conserved land on both sides of the highway then we can really start the, the conversation with mdt and federal highways about getting funding to to actually put in some kind of structure there if that doesn't happen then the options are a little bit more limited so there's other measures like animal detection systems that could go in we talked about this with our technical advisory committee um, and especially with all of the uh, driveways and access points and stuff like that, it will be difficult because um, they can be triggered by all of these different things going across the highway. Technology is improving where there's actually um, thermal detection systems and things like that, so they're only actually detecting wildlife, um, especially with all of the AI. You can actually train these uh, cameras and sensors to identify that it's wildlife and not a car, um, but these are pretty experimental at this point. So they're also less effective at reducing collisions and uh, less effective in terms of um, maintaining habitat connectivity. So um, it's it's pretty tough. And I think the, the biggest conversation I think in Gateway is the land conservation piece. Thank you. Um, Emma, do we have any questions from the online folks? OK. Yeah, let me know when to stop. I've got quite a few questions on here. So um, Jerry asked, would crossings like this work to connect grizzly bear populations? And I did see a grizzly um, organization on the participant list. So I assume that is true, but any more uh, comments about the grizzlies? Yeah, the, the good news is there's been, uh, again, the Banff crossings were in grizzly country. so. There's been quite a bit of study of how grizzlies use the crossing structures. 
And what they found was if they wouldn't have put in the overpasses, uh, that the females and the cubs uh, primarily just used the overpasses and the two underpasses that are actually bridges, so they're big open uh, underpasses. So um, that information really shows that you can have, it's called, uh, you know, a certain segment of the grizzly population that wouldn't be connected. Uh, so um, one thing you have to uh, realize if you're really trying to mitigate for grizzly bears, you have to have both over and under passes in your design uh, to accommodate uh, the different uh, sec segments of the population to, to make it work. So, uh, so, and they can be built uh quite easily i mean they're built on 93 the overpass on 93 ultimately was uh designed for grizzly bears because of the bamp uh they put it in the wrong location it hasn't had grizzly bear use uh and but the grizzly bears are using some of the underpasses but they didn't uh do genetic testing of that so they don't know if it was just the males and the subadults so you want to any questions? Any hands up here? Okay. Okay, a question from our audience in person here. Maybe up here is better. Okay. Um, well, I'll start with the easier question. I have two. One is um, what you see as for Montana being the most effective funding lever, right? We have federal allocations, legislative allocations, executive allocations, um, private funding, county funding, just where you see the the most likely opportunity in Montana. Okay, that's a good question. Funding is always a big one. These things are expensive. Um, one thing that I do want to point out that's encouraging in Montana right now is that for really the first time ever, we have a formal statewide wildlife and transportation partnership. And that um, is basically a formal agreement between the DOT, Fish, Wildlife and Parks, and then Montanans for Safe Wildlife Passage, which is a coalition of different NGOs and citizens working on this issue. Um, and it's expected that there's gonna be a application process specific to Montana rolling out here shortly that will provide some funds for things like feasibility studies, um, as well as basically getting the agencies on board to move forward with an application for federal funding. And you talked about county funding, state funding, stuff like that. A lot of these federal programs require a 20% non-federal match. So really in order to get, um, to take advantage of these big infrastructure dollars, you're gonna have to combine it with state dollars or county dollars or private investment to make up that extra 20% to really um, move a project forward. I'd I'd like to add another comment though. Uh, what what a big shift has taken place, and it was most of the crossings that were that you see ar uh, around the state have always been only when there's a highway project, a highway improvement project. So you need highway construction to pay for the mitigation, which is the structures, uh, the crossing structures. These new programs, the federal program that Liz pointed to, and the state is now uh, both you can just build crossings because they're needed. You don't have to wait 25 years until a highway construction project comes up. So that's a big thing that's really just shifted in the last couple of years, which I think is really exciting. You can put them where they're needed most, not where there's just a highway project, uh, a rebuild uh, coming up. So uh, I, I think that opens up a lot of opportunity for folks around the state. So, yeah, here we go. Um, and I'm going to put you on the hot seat for a harder question. Um, on that map that was uh, in your presentation earlier, Rob, early on uh, showing the hot spots around the state, um, 93 north of Missoula is still having a lot of collisions, um, even though it's got 
quite a few crossing structures. So I was just hoping you could speak to that and what you've learned. Yeah, uh, my colleague Marcel Hauser uh, did the the research and monitoring on on that both before and for seven years after uh, US 93 was uh, all the structures are built uh, on the Flathead Reservation and uh, overall the total collisions haven't decreased uh, so they expanded the road they knew there was more volume but they're not occurring where the mitigation occurred. So where the crossings and the fences that direct animals to the crossings are located, they've uh, 80, 80 to 100 percent improvement reduction in wildlife vehicle collisions. But where the, the mitigation doesn't exist, uh, for example, that's a 50 mile stretch and there's only 15 miles of fencing. So all those gaps have are are where all these accidents are occurring at the levels of pre-mitigation. So uh, Marcel has also pu published a paper to show that um, if you build a structure and uh, don't have five kilometers of fencing with the structures, uh, then they are about 50% effective in reducing wildlife vehicle collisions. If you have five kilometers or more fencing with the structures, you get the 80 to 100% reduction. So uh, structures by themselves, only rarely when they're perfectly located and animals like say they're following a river, that makes good sense, right? But anyhow, so th the story for 93 is the mitigation worked, but they didn't mitigate the whole thing because of all the, there's businesses, there's driveways, there's homes. Uh, it's a complicated landscape, just like the Gallatin Gateway area. So uh, that's something to keep in mind, a lesson learned maybe. Okay, thank you. Um, we're gonna head over to Emma with some more online questions. Yeah, so a few more questions about um the crossings themselves um let's see colleen is asking about the approximate payback time per structure and then on a similar note ryan asked about the maintenance um of the crossings and the fencing um who takes care of that is it the department of transportation um different fencing methods frequency of maintenance cost of maintenance and all of that okay thank you Yes, yeah, so payback is based on uh, two things. One is what's the crash rate in the road segment you're treating with the mitigation, with the crossing and the fencing, right? So um, if you have a, lo a lot of crashes, then the investment in the, in the crossing and the fencing will pay back much uh, quicker, or you uh, because uh, you're you're saving all those those collisions that aren't occurring are you know the public benefits from that it's it saves from all those crashes and so um it's somewhat complicated uh because oh gosh it's um it, it, you have to use a um like a model to to figure out how you project dollars invested now versus dollars that are paid back 70 and 75 year from now dollars you know so the cost, cost of a dollar changes over the 75 year life of the structure so they actually in the paper that was published in 2009 there's an equation in there that takes into account all of this and so i'm i'm giving a very complicated answer here but um the simple answer is the higher the crash rate the quicker the payback basically and you can calculate quite easily like what that rate is like what that cost is per year to to pay for uh the even the most expensive the overpasses with with fencing and in the old i i'll go to the old numbers and um for an overpass and fencing it was 5.1 deer collisions per mile uh, if you had that kind of rate, uh, you could build a crossing and fencing and it would pay for itself over the lifetime, the 75 year lifetime of the overpass. So uh, so that's all 
uh, worked out, and there's there's ways to look at that uh, that sort of break even point. There was another part of that question, um, and that was about maintenance. And really, the amount of maintenance depends on a lot of different factors. Um, you know, in terms of erosion, topography, if you have crashes that are taking down fencing, things like that. One of the tough things is that oftentimes it's easier to get, not easier, but oftentimes there's money available to do kind of this uh, capital investment, this one time build the structure. Um, and there's federal dollars available to pay for that, but the maintenance burden does fall on the state. And so that's one of the, the tough things for uh, you know MDT or other states to, to take this on is yes, they can get federal dollars to build these structures, but ultimately they're gonna be paying for maintenance for 75 years. So they have to factor that in as well. Okay, good question. Uh, let's go. Oh, is there a hand up? Oh, okay. Do they provide any funding or will they? No. The insurance companies have a lot of skin in this game. If you approach them for any funding and how willing are they? I had a small disagreement with if they draw, lower my rates for putting a putting a brush guard on my pickup and they said no. And I said it, it's going to save me 4000 bucks. Uh, they've been approached many times, uh, the insurance companies. And the answer is, I, I tell people, think of it um, uh, so they have actuaries that just figure out risk. And then it's absorbed by people who pay for insurance. And so that's how they address it. Um, they, they, they're not in the business to solve this problem. And I say, think about drunken driving, you know? Have they invested heavily? Uh, no. You, you pay you pay more or you lose your license right or you may not get insurance so so they're very they're neutral let's just say they're uh, they're not uh, every now and then they'll uh, they have a foundation that will uh, fund some study or state farm does this annual report what what's the risk in your state what's the worst state uh, but um, it doesn't invest in mitigation measures or solving the problem and it's really they're not in the business for it you know just to be fair uh but it uh, uh that idea has come up as long as i've been doing this and it I, and it hasn't the answer hasn't changed i'm going to go to another online question and then back to our audience here Emma. All right, next we can have a couple of predator questions. Um, Carl asks, is it true that predators learn and take advantage of the higher prey concentrations around crossings? And then AH asked if the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks is factoring in road-related deaths in the wolf count when they're um, determining quotas for how many wolves can be hunted and where and how that um, affects the regulation of elk numbers. Uh, yeah, so the, it's called the prey trap hypothesis that um, the predators were just going to hang out where it's fenced and directing all the prey right to them, right? Uh, and there have been two studies that published uh, re, uh, papers on this, and Tony Clevenger was one of them because all, in Banff, all the structures are continuously fenced. There's no gaps. The only place animals can get across are through the structures. And so if any predator is gonna hang out, it's gonna be in the BAMP system, right? And uh, it, they just um, disproved it. And then a second paper came out and also disproved it. Um, in Wyoming, when they built the 191 crossings near Pinedale for pronghorn and mule deer, they were concerned about hunters hanging out around there so what they did is they closed the area around the structures, the hunting district around, the, there were, what is it, six underpasses and two overpasses, the eight structures with all the fencing, and they just closed it to hunting for two or three years until the animals could uh, get to it. But because it's a migration, it's like they know when they're coming, right? Uh, so it was a problem, but then they lifted it and I guess it, they never have put it back in, so it doesn't seem to be a problem. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, just the one. Oh. I said it already. But oh, you did. Oh. Well, why never mind? Um, yeah, that other question was about um, are they factoring in uh, road deaths in the wolf count uh, when determining hunting quotas? Okay. Yeah, um, to, to whoever that, that was online there, that is a, a definitely a question for FWP, but I do not know the answer to it. Okay, we have a number. Oh. I don't think that they do. From what I understand, that was not taken into account. But I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm... Say who you are. Um, Clinton Nagel, president of the Gallatin Wildlife Association. Um, we have a number of hands up here, so we'll have another one. Hold on, I'll get to you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gary Tabor. Um, Rob and Liz, I, not thinking about the current criteria for how crossing structures are decided and, and using federal or state dollars, given that wildlife crossing structures are becoming more mainstream, and what I've heard about what's going on in, in, in Gallatin Gateway, could a crossing structure be considered public art? that it serves just, I mean, these things can be made beautiful and they could really serve, you know, just local migration. They may not qualify for these kind of governmental funds, but they could be considered an investment by a community into something that is beautification or art. I don't know if you think of it like that. And have you heard anything like that? <laughs> okay. Gary, I think that's a super interesting point. Um, I know that there have been instances um, in Canada where they've used public art in things like medians and traffic calming measures to basically slow uh, vehicles down. So part of the investment is to reduce collisions with wildlife and part of the investment is to basically um, provide art and make it so that drivers are forced to slow down as opposed to just putting up signs asking them to, which typically people don't follow. Um, in terms of a massive structure like a overpass for elk, I've never heard of that happening, but I think it's a it's an interesting concept. And I guess um, for something like that to occur with an MDT's right of way and to, for it to be going over top of the highway, I think there would be probably a lot of uh, regulatory constraints on that, but it's an interesting proposal. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more from the audience here and then I'll go back to Emma for the online questions. Again, with the um, bridges, uh, would they possibly be um, a way to advertise for say an insurance company, like a banner or a billboard? I mean, a sponsorship of sorts, you know, art sponsorship, would that be something or has that ever occurred anywhere in the world? Uh, uh, getting back to the insurance companies, at least in Canada, I've heard examples of because they have provincial insurance, right? Like it's not necessarily private sector insurance like we have that compete for the same market. The province might provide you get your insurance through the province. There have been cases where the insurance companies have worked to help re, uh, basically build crossings. So I've heard of a couple examples, one in Alberta and one in Saskatchewan, I think so. Um, but here in the US, um, again, uh, I, I haven't, I, I would hope that industry would be more involved, like automobile makers. I mean, there's many different um, private sector uh, tra in the transport industry uh, that could potentially see it as a way to um do social responsibility i think it's called or social investment so but at, to date it hasn't happened uh much or anywhere that i know of so uh, we need to uh get that started i guess thank you uh we have time for just a few more questions and i'm going back to the online folks emma is it fair to sneak one of my questions in here sure 
Okay. So we talked about uh, decreasing collisions. Um, what do we know about the increases in connectivity? Like, do we have data on previously isolated populations that are now like in the same gene pool after installing these um, crossings? Yes, um, and this I can I can hit on maybe this question and another one that was asked previously. So Rob was talking about the project on Highway 191, also just south of here. Um, it's at Trappers Point, which is a bottleneck to a migration route for pronghorn um, and also for mule deer. So it's now the the longest recorded migration in the lower 48. It's called the Hoback to Red Desert Mule Deer Migration. It's also the path of the pronghorn, first federally designated wildlife corridor in in North America, um, and they put in two overpasses, six underpasses, um, and basically what they found is they reduced pronghorn vehicle collisions by 100%. Um, it was over 80% for mule deer, and they had increased back and forth movements by pronghorn of over 600% once they put it in the crossings compared to after based on caller data. Great. Okay, we'll take one last question from the audience here. Yes, I'm Robert Lindstrom from Hebgen Lake, and we have a buffalo problem. We'll have like a herd of 150 buffalo wandering out of the park. This is along the Madison River, Madison River Wildlife Corridor. And 150 bison will wander, try to wander across the highway. And uh, just a few weeks ago, a semi truck just drove right through the middle of the herd and just took out 13. You know, and this is not uncommon for people that are in West Yellowstone for this kind of. Yeah. Sorry. This is not uncommon for this to happen in West Yellowstone. And over the years, since bison resurgence in the late 80s, we've had over 150 bison collisions, mostly with, with semi-trucks, because vehicles can usually stop or see the bison. But the semi-trucks are going fast. The visibility is usually poor. It's icy. There's hills and curves. So we have a serious problem with bison collisions with pickup with 18-wheelers. Uh, is there any chance, instead of, uh, you know, you know, protecting the entire Highway 191 from West Yellowstone to Bozeman, can we just eliminate, can we eliminate the, this, the 18 wheelers from Highway 191? What's cheaper, eliminating the 18 wheelers or building the overcrosses and uh, fencing and so on? Thank you. So this is actually something that we talked about with the Technical Advisory Committee. Um, and when speaking with federal highways, you know, uh, US 191 is considered a freight route. Um, and so it's unlikely that it will ever be um, permanently closed to freight vehicles. But there are some things that could be done like nighttime closures for semis. Um, what we noticed in a lot of the area in Yellowstone National Park where we had additional data sets that were collected by the Park Service, there's a whole bunch of large animals getting hit that are not resulting in reported crashes. So basically what we can infer from that is that they're not being hit by these smaller passenger vehicles when we're talking about collisions with bison or elk or grizzly bears that aren't getting reported that would likely, you know, wipe out a regular passenger vehicle. Okay. Right. So so when you have the semi traffic, a lot of times you have a lot of animals dying and they're not being reported and that means that they're not going into MDT safety metrics and how they evaluate road safety. Um, so I think there are potential, you know, regulatory avenues that could be taken. I don't think US 191 will ever be permanently uh, closed to freight traffic, but I think um, reducing freight traffic or closing down freight traffic at night is potentially on the table. It was closed a couple of years ago when they rebuilt the road at Big Sky. Yeah. Is there any way that we can kind of have that, you know? Uh, extend that, expand that. Uh, yeah, closure. I think a lot of people on 287 were pretty upset about that when they were redirected over there. So, uh, yeah, I think that will be contentious, but I think there's maybe options to pursue. Well, the big trucks can go from, from Idaho Falls to Butte on the freeway and then to Billings and then to Bozeman without having to come through the scenic route right through the middle of Yellowstone Park. I don't know how much longer that is, but I don't think it would be much more time. You want to talk about freight highways versus other types of highways, Rob? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're almost out of time. So, and we have one last speaker to briefly talk. Um, Emma, did you have one burning question? Okay, hold on. I'm bringing you the microphone. 
All right, I think the best question to end on is Kristen's, which is how can Bozeman locals get more involved? Okay, Liz. Um, so I think at the moment, the best way to get involved is really to help us continue to collect data. Um, so we can send out links to all of the registration, uh, all the people who registered for this and give you instructions on how to download that smartphone app and help us continue to get better data on where animals are getting hit, especially the smaller or more rare critters, and also where you're seeing wildlife next to the road, on the road, successfully crossing, things like that. Um, and that can inform future decision making. Uh, the other thing is please um, you know, attend our events later this year where we'll really be trying to pull together different members of the community, um, agencies, organizations to discuss what the most important actions are to take, what would be supported by the community, and how uh, basically we can partner to pool resources and capacity and actually make a difference. Excellent. Thank you, Liz. And, and as she said, we, uh, those who registered, will be sending out this information in a follow-up email. If you didn't register, no worries. We will post it on the Gallatin Valley Earth Day website. So, um, and if you subscribe to our newsletter, we'll be sure to include those events in our future newsletters that Liz was talking about. Now, um, without further ado, we're running out of time here, but we have one last um, important speaker. He's just going to speak very shortly. It's Clint Nagel, as he said, he's from the Gallatin Wildlife Association, and they're doing fantastic work, um, especially involving wildlife crossings. Uh, Clint had a long career with the U.S. Geological Survey. He retired in 2009, and we're lucky he got made his way to Bozeman here in 2011, and he's keeping busy with some very important volunteer work. Um, he is, as I said, the president of the Gallatin Wildlife Association, and he's also active with several other nonprofits in Gallatin Valley. So, um, Clint, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to talk just really brief here. And uh, the last, the last question that you asked was uh, basically, what can we do as citizens? Uh, to make this become a reality, uh, I asked the same question because uh, the last thing was the uh, the slaughter of the 13 bison up in uh, Madison Crossing in West Yellowstone. I thought that's a, that's enough. You know, I got tired of hearing about all the uh, the killing on highways. Uh, either elk killing on the Gallatin Gateway area. I think there was 17 in the month of December or November through December, something like that. And um, I get emotional about it. And we've been fighting this for a long time. Uh, GWA is also a member of the Montanans for Safe Wildlife Passage. So we're working in uh, regard with the uh, um, Department of Transportation, Montana, Montana Department of Transportation and Fish, Wildlife and Parks. But uh, that didn't seem to be enough. Uh, so we're, we decided to do some things on our own. And one of the things that we have done is we, uh, we have a billboard. I don't know how many of you have seen it on I-90 west of uh, Belgrade. And it basically it says, wildlife need an overpass. And we have a picture of it out on our table out here. So basically what we need to do is increase public awareness. And really, from what I understand and from what I've heard over the last couple of years, nothing is going to happen unless the public get involved. And by that, I mean the public has to contact their county officials, uh, city officials. Um, they got to contact uh, politicians, write letters, let the, your representatives know that there is a need out there. And that's what we're doing. We've been in contact with the Gallatin County Commissioners already. Uh, we're going to be in contact with uh, Cam Shally, the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park, and Mary Erickson, uh, the forest, uh, forest Service Supervisor for the Custer Gallatin National Forest. We've been in contact with uh, West Yellowstone City Town Council. Uh, Bob Lindstrom back there has been doing that on our behalf. And so we got, we've been in communication with a lot of different uh, entities 
And surprisingly, there's a lot of support for that. But it's nothing is going to change unless you people and those online and many, many others start raising your voice and say, we want some action. We have a problem here and we want it resolved. That's the only way this is going to happen uh, because from what I've understood is that um, Department of Trans Montana Department of Transportation is, they want public support before they do anything. And we can sit here and talk about all the problems that we're seeing, but nothing is going to change unless we convince them to do something. So that's that's what we're doing right now, and that's why we're sponsoring this event. Thank you. And uh, they can visit your website, right, to find out more information, and that is? GallatinWildlife.org. Okay, thank you, Clint, so much. Oh, Emma, did you have one? Oh, oh, for the online folks, please, I wanted to alert you that um, we have some handouts from uh, the organizations here that are participating. So if you look on your screen, there's a little place that says handouts. You can click that and download the handouts. Uh, everyone in person here, you could just go out in the lobby and there are um, physical handouts on the tables there for you. Um, I just want to thank you again for coming. Um, there is This event is being recorded, and it will be available on our website probably sometime tomorrow. And uh, if you registered for the event, we'll be emailing you the link to the recording with some additional information. I just wanted to alert you that our next event is actually right here, also live streamed next Friday night. Um, we'll be learning about conservation in Africa. Um, we're very lucky that Mark Butcher, who's a Zimbabwean pro guide, will be actually here in Bozeman for a few days, and he's going to be sharing with you the successes, success stories from the front lines of conservation in the Hwange National Park in Zimbabwe. And again, that's Friday, March 3rd at 7 p.m. right here at the Lutheran Church and also online. Um, the talk is called African Inspirations. Conservation Successes in Hwange National Park, and you can register for this event at our website, and um, also in the follow-up email, we'll give you a link. So I just wanted to thank you again all for coming, and um, yeah, stay involved, and we'll see you again. Thanks.